So welcome everyone to this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. Uh, today I'm very happy to present Philippe Saint-Jean, who is a new faculty member at the Université de Montréal. Uh, he works on quantum photonics and various aspects of quantum optics uh, and their connection to condensed matter systems and strongly correlated electrons as well as sort of hopefully. topological <laughs> properties of materials. Hopefully this is plans for the future. Um, but I, I first met him while he was a PhD student, so the Polytechnique. Uh, he was already a, a very uh, good student at that time uh, in the group of Sébastien Franca, uh, working on optical properties of quantum defects. Um, and uh, I think he's continued on some, to, to do some very nice work uh, as uh, he finished his PhD in 2016 at Polytechnique and went on as a postdoc at CNRS uh, uh, and at the, well, for, with a CNRS position at uh, Saclay exactly. in Paris. Exactly. Uh, and uh, uh, so I saw his talk on, at an intrigue meeting a little while ago, a virtual meeting, and I thought it was really interesting stuff and probably would be a very good topic for a broad colloquium audience and also it's very nice to get people who are young and active and who've been in the ecosystem in, in Montreal uh, to come and give a talk. So those of you who are graduate students and postdocs, uh, Philippe has graciously agreed to meet with you after the colloquium at the après colloque. Uh, there will be an après colloque not for faculty members but for grad students and postdocs in the lounge next door and I'll make another announcement at the end of the talk. So please take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bill, for this really kind introduction. It, it's, it's been a while since I came to the Rutherford Building, uh, so it's, uh, I'm really glad to be back uh, and to share with you a little bit of what I've done uh, over the last few years. So most of the, the almost all of the, the stuff I'll be discussing today about is works I have been involved uh, during my postdoc at uh, a Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, which is a lab that, it's a French system, so it's a bit more complicated, but it belongs both to the CNRS and University of Paris, Saclay. And, and so the title of my talk is Synthetic Topological Materials Made of Light and Matter. And, and just to briefly summarize where I'm heading, um, what I would like to discuss today is about uh, topological phases of matter, but not in their usual framework, where we study electrons moving in solid state crystals. Rather, we would like to look at what we call synthetic materials that are made out of electrons moving in a periodic potentials, but photons or other types of waves moving in a, per, uh, a synthetic uh, potential landscape. All right, so before getting started, I would just like to give you a brief overview of topology and what are topological phases of matter, how, why we are interested in these and how we can emulate them in, in synthetic materials. So before becoming a trend in solid state physics, topology is a branch of mathematics that is interested in geometrical properties of objects. And more specifically, topology is interested in global properties that are robust to smooth deformations. So one of the most notable examples of such a topological property is given by this uh, quantity here that is called a genus number. And so if you look at it, it it's given by the integral over the entire surface of a three-dimensional object of the curvature. So we know very well the curvature. The curvature is a, ro a, a local property. It changes from, place to, from point to point over a surface. So if you were to take an object and move it, this scalar field would be changing continuously. However, if you take the integral over the entire surface, divide by 4p minus 1, you end up having a situation where the result is always an integer. All right? And this integer cannot change even if you distort uh, your, your, your object. It will remain the same unless you start to poke a hole in the surface and then as a result, g is related to the number of holes. So for this orange, for example, you would have a genus of 0. And you can deform it, it will stay zero unless you start to poke a hole in it. And for example, for this donut, you would have g equal one. So g is what we call a topological invariant. And what have peop people recognized in the early 1980s is that we can define such topological properties in condensed matter. But in that framework, we don't usually define these properties in real space, like I did with the curvature, but we do it in the reciprocal space. So we know that we have a crystal, so we have a periodic arrangement of atoms, so we can work in the Fourier space of momentum, and in this subspace, we can define a new property. And so usually we work with a quantity called the Chern number, which I, I have described here. So you see that it's the integral now over the entire Brillouin So it's still a global property of the band structure you integrate over the whole reciprocal space, or the Brillouin of something, an object called the Berry curvature, which is 
again, some, something reminiscent of a curvature, but not in real space as a function of the quasi-momentum k, and you integrate it. And this quantity here is always going to give you an integer value. And to give you maybe a physical intuition of what, how you build this number different than zero in a real band structure, I like to give the example of the topological insulator, which is really, really well known, really famous, but I think it's really um, uh, instructive uh, to see what is, what is happening to the wave functions. So if we take a normal insulator, I like to take the example of gallium arsenide. This is a material I've worked a lot with, and we consider it an insulator because it has a gap over the, around the Fermi energy. And if we look now at the conduction bands, not at energy, but at the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, the wave functions, it is formed by block waves formed from electrons belonging to S-type Vanier states. Whereas for the, con for the balance band, we have electrons belonging to the P-type orbital. Now, if we start to perturb this crystal by introducing, for example, spin orbit interaction, what people have shown is that we can change this band structure. We can perturb it, we can close the energy gap. And if we continue to increase the spin orbit interaction, let's assume that we, it's a knob that we can tune at will. We end up with reopening the gap with now a band structure that has these eigen. So you look, the energy is the same. If they were, there were no colors, these two band structure would be the same, but the color is drastically different here. At high, at, at negative value of momentum, you have S type electrons, and they move to P type and they go back to S type. So you have a winding of the symmetry properties and you have the complementary in, in the balance band. So somehow they have shared, they have exchanged symmetry properties inside. And so if we were to calculate new, for this case, we would have plus or minus one for spin up or spin down electrons. And in this other case, because we don't have any winding of the symmetry properties, we end up with a trivial value of zero for new. And all of this, the, most of the interesting physics occur when you put in contact two of these different materials, two, two of these insulators. So as I said, the only way to change the genus number before was to poke a hole. Now the on, only number to change, the only way to change the turn number is to open a gap and re, close a gap and reopen it. All right. So if you put these two materials together, the block wave function will not be able to hybridize correctly. And in order to have to, to have a, a, a a continuity in the wave function between these two materials, the system will have to close its energy gap and reopen. And as a result, at the interface, you will have localized mode that belong in a range of energy that is gapped on both sides. So we say that these states here are protected because they cannot scatter in the bulk, even if your interface has some defects or um, some, corners, some corners that the electron needs to move around. So they cannot, back, they cannot scatter in, in both cases. And you have one direction that is sigma plus polarized, so electrons spin up. The other one is electrons spin down. So the electrons moving across this interface, along this interface, cannot backscatter because that will require a magnetic impurity, reversing the spin. And so we, we talk about these edge states as protected, topologically protected edge states. And usually this is what we want to harness in these materials. The robustness of these states, we want to study uh, how we can make different families of these states and how we can take profit of, of their robustness properties. All right, so here I'm just showing the uh, I mean, the first example of such a topological insulator that was realized in a, in a material with very heavy haton, mercury and tellurium, to have this strong spin orbit interaction. And as a result, people really did observe at the interface with vacuum. Vacuum can be considered a uh, conventional insulator. At, at the interface of exactly spin polarized unidirectional electronic modes moving in one direction. And that can circumvent, uh, contour uh, any defect. They are robust to perturbation. And, and, and uh, more recently, so that, that, that was some time ago, more recently, I would say in the 2005, between 2005 and 2010, 2015, people started to recognize that this is not, this is not a, a, a phenomenon that, that, is, that is bound to electrons moving in solid state crystals. It's just a wave mechanics problem. And if you have any types of wave that are moving in a periodic system that emulates these, these, these crystals, you're going to have the same protected edge states. And so people have started to design periodic arrangements for different types of waves. So electromagnetic waves, so photonic. So in this case, you change the index of refraction spatially. And so electrons, uh, photons will be moving through a surface. And if you engineer the properties of this variation of index of refraction in a very, very careful way, you can start to build a topological insulator for light. So this is an example taken from the group of Moti Segev at Ternion where in the end you have a photonic mode that is bound to the, to the edges 
of their crystal, their photonic crystal. This is, this is a really uh, cool example taken from the group of Sebastian Huber at ETH, where this is mechanics, this is, these are vibration moving in a, in a lattice. So rather than having, this is, this is really huge, these are pendulum, real pendulum, um, hanging from the ceiling. Each of them is coupled with a spring, and if the couplings respect some symmetry properties, in fact, this array of pendula mimics the physics of a topological insulator. So you, you, you start to push a, a, a one of the pendula that is at the edge, and only the, it will propagate, the vibration will propagate on the, along the edge of the array. And, and also you have maybe uh, more sophisticated ex experiments with cold atoms. You have atomic waves uh, that are bound into an um, optical lattice. So lattice made out of diff by diffracting a laser beam. In this presentation, we will be mostly interested in photonics aspects here. And, and, and why do we care about e extending this topological physics to the photonics realm? Um, I like to say that the main reason is that it provides a complementary approach to explore physics beyond what is physically reachable, usually in condensed matter. And what I mean by that, I usually take three, three different examples. So these systems are fabricated artificially. They're fabricated in a clean room. And contrary to a solid state crystal, which nature gives us, where you have access to a, 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 a rich variety, but a finite variety of different materials on Earth, here we can start to think about positioning our atoms a bit randomly at our will because they're fabricated in a clean room. And I'll show you exactly how we can do this. And I'll even show an, ex uh, an experiment that, that implements materials that don't, don't exist in, in, in nature so that we can start to, uh, to explore these, these physics in these systems. They're also very versatile. They're, uh, we have a lot of control on how we, 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 we fabricate them. It's not this, we don't rely on the, the uh, synthesization of any material. Uh, it's a complementary uh, system, so we have bosonic particles. So we have different quantum statistics that can play a role in many areas. It's also a, a system that is inherently open, so photons can leak outside of the cavity and come back if we use a laser field to drive some systems like that, contrary to electrons that are usually bound to stay inside the crystal. So this is a non-emission system, and we can take profit of this driven dissipative nature or non emeticity to, to engineer new effects that are interesting. And also photons are really interesting uh, technologically and, and this allows us to develop new uh, generation of photonic de device that perhaps could be more robust to fabrication defects or, or environmental fluctuations. All right, so this brings me to the outline of what I would like to discuss today. I would like to show you uh, the framework that we, have be, that we will be um, working on, which is not exactly photons, but it's, 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 it's photons strongly coupled to matter excitations which we call polaritons, and we use this, these polaritons. So I, sh I will show you what I mean by that, how we do that, and why we, why we care about these this particles. And then I will show you two examples, one that, that dates a little bit, where we showed uh, a lasing action occurring in a topologically protected edge states, and a more recent example where we have extracted uh, this, this, this uh, fundamental quantity I was discussing about this topological invariance directly from the bulk of, of a material. And finally, I would like to, to take a few minutes perhaps to, to this, if, if, time, if time allows, to discuss what I, I'm heading to in the, in the upcoming years. Okay, so as I said, we won't be working with naked photons. We'll be working with photons that are addressed by electrons, by electronic excitations. And so the, the, um, I would say that the first, we start with uh, this type of configuration, which is a, a planar cavity that is grown by epitaxy. So it's a stack of, of atomic layers. So they have few nanometers in difference. So they, we have a Bragg mirror here, a Bragg mirror on top that confined photons in a, in a lambda cavity here. And at the center of this cavity, we introduce a quantum well. And the, the, the fundamental excitation of this quantum well at cryogenic temperature at 4K, is we, all of these experiments I'll be showing are done uh, at 4 Kelvin, uh, are excitons. And these excitons have a dipole moment. And, and these excitons will absorb photons confined in, in, within the cavity. And if the excitons emits, absorbs, and re-emits, and reabsorbs the photon many times before the photon leaks outside of the cavity. That is to say, if the Rabi frequency is larger than the DQ rate of the photon outside of the cavity, we enter a regime where we cannot distinguish where we have photons or excitons. In fact, we have a new quasi-particle called a polaritons, which is formed from the linear combination of a photon and an exciton with amplitude here that depends on, on the properties of your system. So how much in energy are your photons and excitons detuned? All right, so these particles are interesting. 
for both of these constituents, for their front, for their, from their photonic uh, fractions, uh, this allows us to confine them in synthetic lattice. So I will show you how we can etch, in fact, these planar cavities to form arrays here that confine these polaritons in a really well-defined geometry. Also, these are really dissipative because photons will eventually leak outside, typically on a time scale around 50 picoseconds. So we can just take these photons and send them to our apparatus. And since these photons carry with them all the properties of the polaritons, their energy, their momentum, their phase, we can really do spectroscopy, basic spectroscopy technique to reconstruct all the, the properties of the polaritons. So I'm showing here an example where we have this cavity, we shine a laser off resonant. It creates a bunch of carriers. I'm going to thermalize. They're thermalized and they populate the lowest energy bands with our polariton bands. Eventually photons will leak outside of the cavity and we measure them as a function of their energy and as a function of the angle at which they came out of the cavity, which we can relate to the, their in-plane momentum. So this is a single click image. It's a 10 millisecond image that we take on a CCD camera. And you see that we can reconstruct all the band structure of, of, of this cavity here. And you see the really nice anti-avoided crossing here between our two polaritonic branch, which shows that we are indeed in the strong coupling regimes. So I'll just take a, a small moment here to, to do a, a small parenthesis. You might wonder why we have this parabolic fun uh, the dispersion formula for photons rather than the linear dispersion. And this comes from the fact that in fact our, our cavity breaks translational invariance along the, the z-axis. And so energy is uh, kc over n, so uh, k square root of k parallel plus something that is, that is confined here. So if you expand this around k equals zero, you really have a, a parabola. This is where it comes from, so there is no uh, issues here. On the other hand, the excellent fraction, so photons usually don't see each other, unless you have a nonlinearity, but um, excitons do see each other to, through the, uh, the Coulomb interactions. And as a result, you can have here a nonlinearity that is really strong a curved type nonlinearity that is extremely strong for exploring nonlinear uh, phenomena. Also, they're sensitive to magnetic field, so we can put these systems in a magnetic field and start to implement um, topological phases that, for example, break time reversal symmetry. And also, they will be very important for one of the examples I will show. It, it, it's, a medi it's a gain medium. It allows us to, to enter a lasing regime. And for this later point, in fact, these polaritons are well known to, to lead to a, a a phenomenon that was historically called uh, Bose-Einstein condensation so, uh, for polaritons. So if you have a low excitation power, again, this non-resonant excitation, you start to populate your whole band, you increase the pump power, and you start to have a massive occupation of a single state. So people were calling this Bose-Einstein condensation. This is something that you need to take with tweezers because we really have an out-of-equilibrium system. There's a really strong dissipation and there's a strong drive also. So rather, I, I usually prefer to call it polariton lasing, which is different from a usual laser because our eigenmodes are still in the strong coupling regime. So we have a fluid that is coherent, highly coherent, but also strongly interacting. And there's an also a very important nota bene that I added here. Since it is intrinsically out of equilibrium, this bosonic stimulation can occur not necessarily in the ground state. It can occur in any excited states. And this will depend on your parameters, on the pump power, on the pump energy, on the detuning that you have between your excitons and your photons and so on. And that will be very interesting because at some point we will, hunt, we will need to have a lasing action in a topological edge state, which is not the fundamental, the fundamental mode, the ground state of our system. All right, so how do we build this, a, a lattice with this? So we usually rely on an approach, a tight binding approach where the building block or atom are these pillars. And these pillars are obtain, obtained by electronic lithography and etching, dry etching techniques. So what you see here is what remains from the cavity. Everything else has been taken out. And, and you end up with, with these cylindrical micro pillars that are a few microns in diameters. And they confine light in all three directions, vertically by the Bragg mirrors and laterally by the variation of index of refractions. So as a result, the eigenmodes of these systems are really discrete energy states that mimic somehow atomic orbital. So we have a ground state that is completely symmetric. That's the S-type orbital that we call. Eventually, you have a doubly degenerate excited state, some P-type orbitals, and so on and so forth. And what you can do eventually is to start to make more complex structure by coupling two of these together, by etching them by a center to center distance that is smaller than their diameter. As a result, the eigenfunction of each of these pillars is going to hybridize. They overlap, and they're going to hybridize. And they're going to form molecular-like states. 
So this is a single pillar and you have a ground state that is going to be doubled. We have a bonding mode here and an anti-bonding mode and everything is the same for everything, uh, every orbital. So this is how we start to make materials. We start to make molecules and we can do any type of molecules. So, so we have been working, for example, recently on benzene-like molecules, so in that hexagonal array of, of micropillars. So you see here the eigenstates that, that you have. These, they're still discrete because it's a zero D structure somehow. Uh, we do one-dimensional lattice where we start to have a band structure. We have bands, we have gaps, just like in the materials. But here you, you, should, you should notice that the Brimoison is, 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 much, uh, is much smaller because the, 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 the distance between the, the, the size of the unit cell is much larger than what it is in the, in the, in the crystal. It's just an order of magnitude. Uh, it just, it's just a number, but the, it's qualitatively the same as in the material. And we also have two-dimensional lattices. So this is a honeycomb arrangement that mimics the physics of graphene. So you have, uh, you don't see them very well, but we can have these nice direct cones here and study the, the physics of these materials. And, and so these are the materials that we use. So if you're interested in, in learning more of how we do this, uh, we have published recently two different uh, review and, and perspective uh, papers on, on this field that is emerging field of topological polyatonics with some of my colleagues. So let me uh, now come to the first example that I would like to discuss, which is, uh, was at the time the first demonstration of a topological, what we called a topological laser that was done in a one-dimensional lattice that, that I showed. All right, so just to, to set up a little bit, um, to do this demonstration, we used the simplest Hamiltonian possible that can carry some to interesting topological properties. This is called the SSH model. It's come from the name of its three creators, Sue Schrieffer and Eager. And basically, at, at the time, it was describing the physics of this polyacetylene molecule. But all you really need to, to know, uh, to care here for, the, for, for, the, for this talk, is that it captures the physics of a dimer change, so a lattice of identical atoms with staggered hopping energies. So weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong couplings. All right, so that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's all there is to know. And for this um, lattice, in fact, you can, different, you, can, you can identify two different dimerization. Either if you decide that you define your unit cell with a strong link or you define it with a weak link. And so obviously this is just a definition. So if you have an infinite lattice, a bulk lattice, there's no difference. And you're going to have the same band structure, which is formed by two bands because you have, in fact, uh, two atoms per unit cell. Now, if you look the eigenfunctions, you will see that within a unit cell, within a unit cell, if you define the unit cell like this, the Vanier states here at the center and the edges of the of the of the of the of the, of the, of the zone, you have wave function evolving in phase, all right? Because we have a bonding band, whereas the upper band is formed by atoms or pillars, where the wave function evolves out of phase, and this is true throughout throughout the the zone. This is not the case for the second case where you define the unit cell not within a dimer but within a weak link. So you should see these. This is, this is a mistake. This should be sm uh, small red lines here, and now here. At the, at, the, at the center of the brain zone for the lower band, you still have these, these wave, this wave function evolving in phase, but now at the edges, because you're considering the wave function for two neighboring dimers, the atoms are evolving out of phase. So you see that if you were to describe this unit cell by its, uh, group, uh, its group, you have an inversion symmetry, so we have an uh, inversion group. So you have the wave function here transformed according to gamma one, this is its symmetry properties. Here it goes to gamma two. Here you have a winding, you go from gamma 2 to gamma 1 and back to gamma 2. Just like for the topological insulator, we were going from P to S to P. And, and complementary here, we have S gamma 1 to gamma 2 to gamma. So for the former case here, we have a winding number that goes to 0. And for this one, we don't expect any edge states if we end up the lattice with a strong link. And for the other case, we have a winding number of 1, and we expect at the appearance of edge states. So if we, if we finish the lattice, with an interface that has this, this weak link. So this is what we have done. And so to emulate this Hamiltonian, we use a, a, a little bit of a tricky approach. So we use this, this lattice here, which is a zigzag-like lattice, all right? And we didn't consider the hybridization, the subspace of the, the hybridization of the ground state of each pillar. We looked at the ground state of the first excited state that is doubly degenerate, okay? And so you can write it in a basis of Px and Py photonic orbitals here, yeah. all right? And, and since the zig and the zag are at 90 degrees, these px and these py are going to be completely orthogonal Hilbert space. And if you look at this one here, the px subspace, 
you will see that um, the coupling here will be either strong if the orbitals are in the same direction, this is like a sigma bond in a chemistry, or weak if they are not oriented in the same direction. This is like a pi bond that we have in chemistry. So you're going to strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. So this emulates somehow, this subspace here emulates the topologically trivial uh, SSH. Whereas in the other case, in the other uh, subspace, you're going to have the opposite, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong. So these are not two different lattices. This is the same lattice. But if you look at one subspace of the wave function, you're going to have something that is topologically trivial. If you look at the other subspace, which is degenerate, you're going to have something that is non-trivial. All right? And, and so if we fabricated this lattice, so we shine a non-resonant excitation against, uh, again, the photogenerated carriers are going to thermalize, they're going to populate the band. And, and so this is what we see. We have the bottom band that is formed by hybridization of the S band. There is a single band because the coupling is identical between each pillar. But we have two bands here for the P bands, which comes from these two bands of the SSH model associated to this dimerization. And so this is a bonding band for PX and PY degenerate. This is an anti-bonding band for PX and PY again degenerate. All right. But now we want to see one of these subspits, so we don't look at it in reciprocal space, but we just do it, the imaging in real space. And what we see is that, okay, I'm taking an image here in real space of this lower band. I see that indeed this is symmetric with respect to each pillar. This is Gaussian mode. This is the, 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 the S band. Now, if I look at the two bands here, the, the, the amplitude vanishes at the center. This is really an asymmetric mode. Same thing here. But now if I look, so this image was the same, but taken now at the edge by just shifting my, my sample with the, my piezos. And now I see that I have a state appearing at the center of the gap. This is, this is my guy. This is, this is my, my edge state that I'm, I'm looking for. And if I look at it in real space, I see that indeed its wave function is, is the, the, the two lobes of the P orbitals are oriented perpendicularly to the axis linking the first and the second pillar. This is really the guy I was looking for. This, this is my topological edge state. And now what we have demonstrated is that you simply increase the pump power here and you start to create a bosonic stimulation. And if you choose carefully your parameters, your, your detuning between the exciton and the photon, uh, your pump power, your pump wavelength, you can have, uh, in fact, this is below, uh, at, at low power, below a lasing threshold. So we have as a function of, of space, energy, so we have our sets of bands, this is the S band. This is the two P band with the edge state here. You have two lobes because these are P orbitals, the two lobes of the P orbitals, and you have higher energy bands. And beyond some threshold, you see that all the intensity comes from a single edge. So this is lasing action occurring in a topologically protected edge state. And you see that indeed you have a, a, a nonlinear increase of, 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 just like in the normal laser, you have a normal increase of the intensity. This is the IP curve, like we, expe we expect. And you have also an increase of the coherence because the line width becomes really narrow and eventually becomes uh, limited by the resolution of, of our sample. So we really have a coherent state. So saying that, what's next to say? Well, I would like to just mention a few words about the robustness of this lasing mode because that, that's the entire point of, of, the, of, of this idea is to explore how much it's resilient to perturbation and to start to study this. And so let me take a step back and go back to the Hamiltonian of, of, of the SSH model. So we have, and this is the Hamiltonian in K space, so we have off-diagonal terms that describes the hopping between the different sites. So a real term for the intracell coupling, a complex term for the intercell coupling, and zero on the, la on the diagonal because all the atoms are identical. And, and all the topological properties of the system are related to the fact that it carries a really special symmetry it's called Carroll symmetry, is the fact that it anti, the Hamiltonian anti-commutes with the sigma z poly matrix. So th this is not as usual. Usually we have a, a, a symmetry that commutes with, a, with an operator. Here it anti-commutes. And the consequence, you can show mathematically that the consequence of this anti-commutation rule are really, are really important. First of all, if you have this, you're going to have an energy spectrum that is always symmetric around E equals zero. As well, you're going to have, if you have localized states, they need to be at the center of the gap. This means that as long as you preserve this, you're always to it, going to have your edge states that is at the same energy equals zero, and that's going to be localized. And so if you start to introduce perturbation in the hopping strains, this is one type of perturbation that you can introduce in your lattice, you don't change because you're going to introduce sigma x and sigma y component to your Hamiltonian. 
which do anti-commutes with sigma z. So you're not going to change anything. And, and this is a calculation that shows that if you start to introduce fluctuation in the hopping energies, you see here, this is the, the band spectrum. You have your two bands become broader and broader because, because your hopping energies are less and less defined. But your edge state always stays mathematically exactly at, at the center of the gap. And it's a highly, highly localized on the first pillar on, on the, at the edge of the lattice. Unless the perturbation becomes comparable to the energy gap, which is the energy scale that always protects you. You're not protected against anything. You need to have, and at some point, your edge state will start to hybridize with the modes here of the bands and start to delocalize. However, if you have a perturbation to the on-site energy, or, or atoms are not identical to each other, then we have a sigma z co contribution and the Hamilton does not anymore uh, anti-commute here. And as a result, we're going to perturb. And so we did this experiment by doing now, not an elongated spot that was eliminating the entire chain, but really localizing the first pillar. And the effect of this is that it creates a lot of electron within this single pillar. And so because the polariton sees just a huge cloud of electrons in the environment, the, the effective index of refraction changes. So this is like shifting the energy of this pillar as a function of the pump power. And we see that as we do this, this is again the energy as a function of the pump power. We have our two bands that are not affected, but the topological edge states has its energy shifting con continuously. So what I would like to say here, maybe that's the last thing I would like to say is that um, you never have perfect chiral symmetry. Your atoms are never completely identical. So what does it mean at, to have this symmetry? It means that your perturbation must be smaller than your gap. And, and as long as you have this, you're going to have a, an edge state. It's not going to be at zero, but it's going to be strongly localized at the edge. So we see that here as a function of the pump power. Here, we see that the squares are the um, experimental data showing the intensity, relative intensity of the first pillar. It doesn't change really much unless you arrive you, you blue shift your mode so much that it reaches the, the gap and then you completely lose it. It hybridizes with the band and, and you're not protected anymore because protection means perturbation needs to be smaller than your gap. The gap is the energy scale that dictates the entire robustness quantitatively. All right, so that was the, um, the first realization of, of lasing in, in edge states. It has been realized in many different systems since then. Um, systems uh, that works at room temperature systems that are really more confined. But more importantly, they have been also realized, uh, and this is really, there's really nice work uh, ongoing right now, on two-dimensional systems where the edge mode is a, 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 a one-dimensional propagating state. So these have been done in a variety of systems. This is also a polytronic systems. And, and, and the thing is that this is qualitatively different. And I would like to take just a few, a few, just one minute to describe why is it so important to shift to the two, to two dimension. And so since a long time, it has been a real long-standing challenge to, to produce solid state lasers that, high, that works at high intensity. If you want to work at high intensity, you start to have a lot of, in, of electric field in, in your cavity. You're going to have any kind of problem heating, um, non-linearities, things like that. So what people have tried to do is not to work with a single cavity, but an array of cavity to distribute the power in the different cavities. But when you do this, you never grow identical cavities and you're going to have your lasing mode that is always pinned to some defect or disorder somewhere. And as a result, these lasers have always been used not for the coherence, but just for just like flash, flashlight to, to, to pump another laser, for example, not for the coherence property, just for producing high intensity. Right here, you have a large number of resonators that behaves as a single laser because they are protected they cannot shift in energy. If you introduce some defects, there is always going to exist a mode. The mode is going to circumvent the defect and to always exist. So although all the center doesn't, is not useful, you start to have a large number of resonators, uh, however you look at it, that are starting to act like as a single laser with a high, uh, with a high uh, power. And so people have been showing that, in fact, this shows a, a really strong benefit in the gain curve and in these, in these properties. All right, so I would just like to say that we have been working recently on, on going to this two-dimensional, which would require using this graphene lattice. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to spend too much time, but there are two main ingredients that we have been optimizing, spin-orbit interaction of light, breaking of time reversal symmetry with the magnetic field. Uh, if you have any question about this, um, feel free to ask me afterward, but um, I'm going to, to just leave it to there. Maybe I can just ask that 
add that we did recently an experiment with a, not an, a, full, a, a full graphene lattice, but just, just one hexagon. And what we showed is that we are able to have a lasing action that goes either in one direction like this or in the other direction like this. It's just like a tiny, tiny topological insulator if you want. I don't even want to call it that because you don't have a bulk, but it, it just captures this physics because it, it also relies on spin orbit interaction and, and, and breaking time reversal symmetry. All right, so how am I doing with time? Okay. Um, this brings me to the second part of my talk, which will be less um, technical, less applied physics, more a bit fundamental, and show how we have made a measurements of, of extracting directly from the bulk this quantity I was describing in my introduction of this topological invariant. And what I would like to show is that we have done this for a, a graphene. So the roadmap for this section is just, I'll show, um, well, how does graphene, how we can define topological invariant in graphene. It is the graphene has edge states that can be re related to invariants. What are they? Uh, how we can define them? And then why is it difficult to extract them? There's, there's, a, there's a small issue and, and how we have made it. Measurements. So I'm just calling back that, in fact, this invariant we usually extract it by just probing the edge. We see there's an edge state, we see, okay, there's one edge state, there's new equal one. Two edge states, new equal two. But it's a bulk property. This is a bulk property. And so one, one should be able to extract it without relying on the measurement on the, on the, on the, on the, on the edge. This, this is the aim of this, of, of this part. It's really to extract this quantity without measuring the edge, just from the bulk. And th this has been done before in the variety of systems doing interferometry measurement with cold atoms, uh, measuring some anomalous displacement, so you have a, a cloud of cold atoms that, that, that can be shifted uh, spatially, uh, or by interferometry measurement uh, to extract the, the Berry curvature. The Berry curvature, not the curvature. Um, mm -hmm. and, and however, none of these techniques can be directly applied for graphene. Uh, and I will show why and, and, and how we have done it. So just to give you an idea, there is a really, really strong link between the physics of graphene and the physics of this SSH model that I just showed earlier. And just before going into the detail, I want to give you an, an, just an insight of why there is such a connection. So this is a sheet of graphene. You have an armchair edge here, have a zigzag edge at the, at the top, and maybe you're not uh, familiar with bearded edge because they're not chemically stable. In real graphene, you don't have them, but we can, we can put our pillow wherever you want and we, we can do that. Now you start to take your, the sheet and you're going to compress it uh, laterally. And you see that all the atoms are going to find on, on well-defined lines that are separated by short, long, short, long, short, long. So you have an intuition of there is, there is something that resembles somehow the SSH, but let's make it more rigorous and, and mathematical. So this is, this is the graphene, this is the unit cell, how it's defined. So here I show the Hamiltonian. So we have zero again, so we have two atoms per unit cell, it's in k-space. The atoms are identical, so I have zero on the diagonal. The off-diagonal terms, I have a real term, it's the coupling within the unit cell, and, and, and two block mode here coupling with the, the two uh, unit vectors. But I can re-express this here, just rearranging the terms, to write it in this form here. And you see that now I have a real term that depends on kx, it's given by this, and I have an imaginary term with a block terms along y, that is, it, it, that is constant. And so this Hamiltonian, in fact, which is, again, the Hamiltonian of graphene, is isomorphic to that of SSH, where we have an intracell coupling that depends on Kx, and an intercell coupling along Y that doesn't depend on Kx. And you see that depending on where you are in the Brillouin zone, as a value of Kx, you're going to have either a trivial or non-trivial if J is greater or smaller than J prime. All right? So what we're going to have is that for each cut in the Brillouin zone, depending on where we are in Kx, we're going to have either a nu of zero or one. All right, and each time we're going to change is at a position where we cross a direct cone. We close the gap and we reopen again. That's, that's, that's uh, convenient. And, and as I showed earlier, here you see that zigzag and Burgess are almost the same. It's just finishing either with a strong or a weak link. And, and if you define the unit cell with a bearded edge, you're going to have uh, the opposite here. And these edges, uh, so, so that you're going to have edge states at not that everywhere in real space, but a really specific position in the reciprocal space. So it means that, that they're moving along a certain Kx. And they have been measured. This is a, a system that was done in, in our group a couple of years ago, but we want to extract that in, in, in the bulk. So to do this, we have implemented a technique that was developed uh, it was developed over by, by many people, but that specific one it, it, with the details 
was developed by a collaborator at ICFO, uh, Pierre Pietro Massignan and Alexandre Dauphin. And, and it relies on a localized excitement. So, so what do we want to have? Just let me just give you where we're going with this. We want to take a single cut in Briouin-Zone and extract for this cut the, the winding number. For each cut will be some effective SSH Hamiltonian. So we have developed a technique for SSH, and then we will extend it to graphene. So let's start first by measuring the invariance of graphene. We have a localized excitation on a single atom, all right? And the photons are going, the polaritons are going to spread over the lattice and they're going to form a spatial and intensity prof, uh, profile. We call psi of the intensity as a function of, of, of the pillar. And we can also define another number that is given by this chiral displacement operator, which is the, the product of the index of the unit cell. So zero, one, two, minus one, minus two. And multiplied by the sub lattice index plus one and minus one for A and B. So you see, you're going to have an array of C's, zero, zero, one, minus one, two, minus two, ta, ta, ta. And so if you do the scalar product between this vector of C's and the intensity on the, with the, the intensity vector, you're going to have something that they call mean Carroll displacement. And what they showed is that in the thermodynamic limits, if you let enough time for your wave packet to, 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 to spread, this quantity is going to tend toward this winding number. Here it's W, uh, it's a mistake, it should be nu. All right, so we have done this. So this is again another lattice where we have, instead of having a zigzag, we have um, pillars are close, far, close, far, close, far from each other. So we're going to work with the S-band of the, 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 the ground state of each pillars, the arbitization. And you see that you indeed have again these two bands that are separated. And what we do now is that we have a localized excitation so these are the two bands in real space. So we have a bonding band, anti-bonding band, and this is the intensity profile. So you're going to integrate this. It gives you this here. This is the in frequency integrated uh, spatial profile. And you multiply it by this vector of C's. Right? You have two ways to define it, either from the, the unit cell defines a dimer or pillars belong to neighboring dimers. So this is the red and blue curve shows these C's. And for each of them, you're going to have a value that is very close to zero. It's again, it's experiment, so you never have exactly zero, but within the experimental um, uncertainty, and you have one for the other. So that, that's, that's the trick we want to do. But now we have a problem because we want to have access to a single momentum component in X and have access to the full real space in Y. And so we need to have access to both, but it's not so much a problem because X and Y are orthogonal. And there is a way to do that. And the way we develop this is to use this imaging techniques. So this is the sample. This is a spectrometer. We have usually two um, objective here, two, two, two lenses that are going, if we only have these two, we're going to do spatial imaging. This is just like a microscope. And now if we had a lens at the Fourier plane, what we're going to image here is that for each, uh, we're going to image the angle at which they come out. So for each angle going to, to be a, a given point, so with a, a, a slit here, we can select a given Fourier component. That's, that's how we do um, reciprocal space measurement. And what we're going to use is, is a cylindrical lens, such that in one direction, it has a curvature, and in the, in the other direction, it has no, no curvature, such that when the light is going to come in one direction in the, in the, in the plane like this, it's going to be, the, the slit is going to select the momentum in this direction, Whereas in the other direction, this lens doesn't have any effect. It's, it doesn't have curvature, so it's just spatial imaging, and we have access to the full spectrum. And so what I'm showing here, it's not SSH. This is really a, a spectrum taken from our system, uh, for lattices of graphene, where we have positioned this slit in order to select this k equals zero component. And you see as a function of, of position, I'm, I'm just positioning artificial atoms here just to, to, to give you an intuition of where we are. And we really have these two bands, just like an SSH bonding band and an anti-bonding band. And now we can compute these, these Carroll. And we don't exactly go to zero and one. I'll come back to this just in a few seconds, but we really have something that is closer to zero and closer to one. And now what we can do is just move our cylindrical lens and span across the Brion zone. And so when we do this, we see that depending on how we define the unit cell, our vector of C, it goes from a high value. And, and the dotted here shows the position of the direct ones. Maximum to minimum to maximum to minimum. And in fact, never goes to, to, so there are two things here that, that, are, that were worried us at the beginning is that it doesn't go exactly to zero, it doesn't go exactly to, to it doesn't go exactly to zero, neither to one, and it's not sharp. And, and this comes from the fact that the argument relies on reaching thermodynamic equilibrium. 
And the problem is that these two-dimensional lattices, um, the quality factor is much lower than in a one-dimensional lattice because they're more difficult to fabricate. So photon stays there much on, 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 on a shorter time scale. And the wave packet doesn't have time to, to well spread over the lattice. So it doesn't exactly go. So, but provided that we were having building better lattices, which is really difficult, we should have something. But we still capture this, this, this idea. And the last thing I would like to discuss here is that we can, uh, as I say, we can ex explore things that are really difficult, or sometimes impossible to do in the solid state. And one phenomenon that we wanted to explore is uh, if you start to compress graphene, you break its uh, rotational symmetry elements. And it is known that when you do this, in fact, your Dirac cones are going to move in the Brimoison. And eventually, if, if, if this compression is too strong, they're going to merge together and there is going to be an opening of a gap. So you have a system that is completely gapped here. So you shouldn't have any transition, topological transition. So reaching this regime is impossible with real graphene because it, it requires too much energy with respect to the chemical bonds of, of carbon atoms. But here we can position our atoms like we, like we want. So this is not a distorted, a distorted image. It's just really like um, we just position the pillars like, like we want. And we see that now when we compute, we only have a single value. It never changes because it, it never crosses a direct cone throughout the brain zone. All right, and, and these are different sp uh, spatial profile taken at different position. So the perspective of this is that while it's a really strong uh, system to measure topological invariant in, in systems that have chiral symmetry. So this, these are interesting perspectives. So we have been working this compression depending on how we apply it and what states we look at. We can build um, direct cones that are a bit unconventional in the sense that they're tilted even sometimes critically tilted where one branch is completely flat and the other one, and, and when you think about it, it's a bit weird because in one, from one branch, you have infinite mass and in the other one, uh, you have zero mass or you have infinite mass, you see. Uh, and so these are really interesting systems that, that we have started to explore and that we could explore maybe um, uh, more, more profoundly. Uh, also, we have access to other bands, P bands that I didn't talk about here in graphene, but that, sh that, that, that also have direct cones, nice, nice edge states uh, with interesting properties. There is also this field of higher order topological insulator where you see when you have a two-dimensional lattice, we say we have a 1D edge state. These systems have D minus 2 dimensionality for the edge state. So for a two-dimensional lattice, you have corner states, 0D states. And if you had a 3D, you would have line states at the, at, at the corner. At the, and and they, they usually have chiral symmetry, so we could extract these higher order topological invariant from that and also systems that have very strong nonlinearity. So this is an example of a SSH lattice realized in the group of Antoine Brouet at the at Institut d'Optique where they showed that these are bose rydberg atoms and in the regime of very strong interaction, hardcore boson, so only one particle can occupy a site at a time. Uh, depending on the filling of your chain, you can have different topolo topological properties, different robustness properties, You're not, it's not chiral symmetry anymore. And it depends on the quantum statistics. It's not the same for boson that it is for fermion. So there's all this interesting physics. And can we extract these, these invariants here uh, through these kind of measurements? We also have recently a paper where we have worked with uh, nonlinear properties and non-emission properties uh, of these systems. So I'm done. I don't want to, to overrun my time. But I would just like to conclude by saying that I hope I've shown a little bit, a, a small overview of what we can do with, uh, with the system to explore this topological physics. Again. Um, complementary to what can be done in solid state, it's, it's qualitatively different. So I showed an example of topological lasing and an example of extracting, because we have direct, direct access to the wave function, to the, 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 the wave function profile, we can extract the, these invariants. So I'll take just one second to, to, to sorry, to, to, to acknowledge the people with whom I work. So Jacqueline, who is heading um, the director of the, of the lab, Alberto Amo, who was working with, with us, who now moved to Université de Lille, uh, these are our collaborators, Pietro Massigna and Alexandre Dauphin. And of course, you, you might have noticed that the quality of the sample is crucial for these experiments. So I would like to, to notice the very good work of, of, of people who have been working in the clean room. Aristide Lemaitre for, Lemaitre for the epitaxy, Luc, Isabelle and Abdou for the um, lithography and etching. Um, so with this, yeah, I won't, I won't go through my, my projects in the upcoming years, but I, I would be happy to discuss it afterward uh, with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you for this excellent talk. It covered basically every area of physics, I think. At some uh, <laughs>
Um, so if you have questions, I'll run around with the microphone. I don't have to get too close. You don't have to hold it. So I'll just hold it near you and please go ahead. So, time. Okay. So uh, first of all, nice work. And uh, I, I was wondering with graphene, uh, you put strain in one direction. Right? Compression. But yeah, Compression. we can do okay. both. Yeah. We can do uh, strain. Um, there's also a lot of work on um, mimicking uh, um, a gauge field by making a strain profile. That yeah. should be really interesting. Uh, we, we did that, in fact. We, we have a, we have, we have a, a, a paper. I was not involved really in this work, but uh, so, so maybe for, for the benefit of everyone, what I'm showing here is a uniform compression. So the compression, the, 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 the distance is the same everywhere. Um, but we can have a gradient of compression and people have shown that if you do this, you can implement a, a gauge field, so like a magnetic field for photons, and, and your edge shades are now lambda level sometimes. And, and, and yes, this has been realized, and we have, we have a, a paper with this. And yeah, if we're lazing in these lambda levels, this kind of physics, uh, maybe you might explain in the okay, coming years. And, and maybe one more question, is that okay? Sure. Um, so uh, your polaritons are bosons. Yes. Uh, and in other materials, we have electrons, which are photon, uh, <laughs> which are uh, fermions. So uh, can you, do you have a way to explore the differences? Because there are some interesting differences. I know not in the single particle yeah, spectrum. Okay. So there, okay, maybe that's a, that's a, that's a, I'll try to answer as, as, as promptly as possible. But to me, there are two main difference. The first one is that um, for only one fermion can occupy uh, a site at a time. Um, and this is the case here. So, so sometimes this regime of hardcore boson is called fermionization because you can only have one boson, not because of Pauli, just because of, of interactions. So this is a fermionization, but the wave function remains symmetric under the exchange. So, the, you, can, you, so you can reach a regime of fermionization if you have very strong interaction. We're working toward that to to boost our, our interaction to reach a regime of blockade, polariton blockade inside each pillar to, to have this fermionization, but you'll never have this anti-symmetric phase. And this is, this is where complementarity, complementarity comes um, at play. I mean, I, it's impossible, I, I guess. Unless, unless, I mean, I'm saying this, but there's also, maybe I, if, I, if I can answer that, there's another way around. It's that if you work in a two-dimensional lattice, there has been proposal that you can emulate fermions um, um, uh, a single photon moving in a 2D grid can be mapped to a pair of fermions mm -hmm. moving in a 1D lattice. It's a bit hard, I, I cannot go into the details, but yeah, be, because you could have a wave function that is anti-symmetric like this, yeah. and as a result, and, and there you could explore a pair of, of strongly coupled fermions mm -hmm. uh, with, yeah, that's how much I, I, I know about that. Are there other questions from the audience? Maybe I can ask some technical questions. Sure. Um, uh, so, what are the what are the limitations to the to the lifetimes of your cavities? So how, how long can you keep the light in the cavity? What is the best Q you can achieve? So right now. Um, we have around 50 picoseconds. Um, and and I'm, I'm showing this image because um, usually this comes out, this, this is a big problem when we want to, to resolve spectrally a very tiny gap. We are limited. The gap needs to be bigger at least than uh, the line width. The line width needs to be smaller than the gap. And, and this has been a problem. For, for example, I'm, I was showing this example and this example here, uh, they're not able to see the gap. It's, it's, it's too small compared to the line width. And, and so it's hard to, uh, to optimize the quality factor. People have been doing a lot of, of, of stuff like this. I think uh, it's always relative to something else. And, and what I've been working recently is to, to start to optimize these, these two, maximize them, to open a larger gap. That's the other way around. And, and there are ways to do this, to um, playing with the, the um, alloy, constitution of gallium and arsenide, you can increase the Zeeman splitting, for example, a lot. And by, by, by tuning the, the symmetry of the, of the cavity, you know, to have exactly a, a, a symmetric cavity, you can enhance the spin orbit interaction. Mm -hmm. And this leads to bigger gap. So I think that the way we're working, of course, on, on improving this quality factor, but in the end, 
often what we end up doing is trying to improve the other energy scale. Here, um, these are interactions at some point. If we want to reach a blockade regime, we need the interaction to be bigger than the line width. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we can push the line width, but at some point we work in the other mass, we end, we end up hitting a wall. And rather we try to boost the interaction by working with different kind of excitations, so coupled quantum wells, this kind of stuff. And is the micron scale basically the optimal wavelength for you? Uh, why not go down to smaller length scales, higher frequencies, or, or larger length scale objects and imagine doing something in another Yeah, oh, yeah. Infrared or uh, or it really depends on, on your material, um, on your transparency window as well. Mm -hmm. um, so f for these material, Gallium Arch Night, where we have really nice quantum wells, because that's the thing, we, we don't have only photons. If we were to work with photons, perhaps we could be working with silicon nitride or something like that, where mm -hmm. quality factors are huge, but, but then you don't have a quantum well to have a strong coupling with electronic excitation. Right. So we're bound to gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide where the quantum wells are really good. And there, I mean, you, you go with the line with that, that's the best, and, and you play around with, the, you want to have a strong absorption in the quantum well, but a weak absorption everywhere else, because you want to have a strong rabbi, couple, uh, rabbi frequency, but a, so, so that, that's a, that's a okay. cast way too. So. Yeah, there's some questions. Uh, I'll go here first and then you uh, up next. Thank you for the talk. Uh, do you see a potential application to quantum computation? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, in, 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 in solid states, I mean, people are working extremely hard to make, um, for example, Majorana modes. And uh, there are people who know this much better than me. There has been very strong claim. There has been very strong uh, on claim recently also. It, it's, it's an ongoing field. Um, right now, I think, for example, some of the projects I'll be working in, in the upcoming years, I hope, is to look at, at can we produce quantum state of light through, a, for example, four wave mixing uh, in a more robust fashion because phase matching is protected because uh, energy matching is protected be because your modes are topologically protected. For example, that, that could be an idea. The other uh, idea, which is maybe not com quantum, it's not necessarily quantum computation, but it's the realm of quantum technologies, is to, uh, to work with ensembles. And ensembles are usually difficult to work with because um, they're at the atoms are positioned randomly. But if you strongly couple them to a mode that is, goes in one direction, there are proposals to, to stabilize some many-body excitation that, that could be useful for generating also interesting quantum states of light. Um, but it, it, it's still a very gray area. Um, yes. Thank you. Okay, next one. Um, thanks for the lovely talk. Uh, I'd love to ask you a bunch of questions about the details, but I'll stick to just one. Um, how many like unit cells can you put into a single sample, like in terms of size, and you see a lot. So, okay. Um, working with a finite number. Okay, so th th that could be a very short answer or a very long answer. I'll, I'll try to, 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 st to stay. So usually, technically, there's no limit. You can be, and, and at some point, there's no need to go bigger because the coherence time or the, the lifetime, photons don't even reach the edge of the cavity. That's the really short answer, but usually we work with 100 unit cell, for example, 200 pillar. There is another problem, though, is that we work with cavities that are not uniform. There is a gradient. So the, the photonic mode changes as a function of where you are. And you need this because, because let's say here I want to work with 9.4 MeV of detuning. What if I wanted to work with minus 4.2? So I would like to work somewhere else on my sample. So what we do is that we have this, this we replicate this lattice many, many times. And depending on where we look, we have different detuning. So the lattice cannot be bigger than this energy scale often. But, I mean, this is just a detail. Uh, usually, we, we, we don't have so much. We're, uh, we're limited by the lifetime of the polaritons in the end. OK, before we thank Professor Saint-Jean one more time, uh, I just want to remind all of the grad students and postdocs in the audience that he'll be available for the next 45 minutes or so in the lounge for a discussion for an après-colloque. Uh, so let's thank him again for a very nice talk. And thank him for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>